Hello everybody, I hope this finds you well. This is a response to 10 more questions Christians cannot answer. This will be my third attempt at this video. Not that the questions are hard and I can't answer them. It's that uh, it's taking too long to answer the questions and uh, it won't let me upload a video that long even though it says I can. Oh well, uh, I'll give it another shot and I'll try to make it a little quicker this time uh, with my answers. I'll try to get pithy and straight to the point if possible. But these questions do require more than just one simple answer. Having said that, uh, let's begin. Question one. The Bible tells us that God sacrificed his only son so that we could go to heaven. But the Bible also tells us that he raised his son back from the dead again. If God didn't really lose his son, then how is that a sacrifice? Turn to your Bible, Isaiah 53. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering of sort of sin, he shall see his seed, and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You understand that, and how Isaiah knew Jesus was coming, you'll have the answer to question number one. Next. Question two. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, and has everything under control, why does he keep asking for money every Sunday? <laughs> question God has never asked for money on Sunday. And if you're talking about the tithe, there is a reason for the tithe. Many churches have perverted this. The tithe was to be a tenth of your income to be given to the poor, the needy, the widow, and the orphan. You have a problem with giving money to poor, needy, widows, and orphans then don't tithe. Next question. Question three. The Bible tells us that God regretted making Saul king. But if that's the case, doesn't that mean God didn't know the future? Because if he knew he was going to regret making Saul king, he would have never done it in the first place. And you say you've read your Bible. Go a little further back in that book you got that from. Well, here, I'll help you. Turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 8, go to verse 6. And these things displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And it goes on down here, and what the Lord told Samuel. The Lord told Samuel, Go ahead and do as they ask. Anoint them a king. But first tell them this. And then he reads off a long litany. A long litany of things that a king's going to do that are wrong, that shouldn't be done. Did, Sam, did God know Saul was going to mess up? Yes, he knew God. God knew Saul was going to mess up. Governments are the beast system spoken of in the Bible. You have no understanding of this matter to say because God repented having done it that he didn't know it ha would happen. I have done things in my life that I knew would end wrong. I did them anyway because it had to be done at the time. And I regret having had to do them, yet they had to be done nonetheless. Did that make it wrong? Or did that make me wrong. No. Next.
next question. Question four. If every complex design requires a designer, who designed God? This is about one of the dumbest questions I've ever heard this man ask. Next one. That one's just too stupid to answer. Question. Question five. If nothing can come from nothing, then how did God create the universe out of nothing? Question six. Five and six are related. If something can come from nothing, why do we need God to create the universe? Nothing comes from nothing. And nowhere in the Bible does it say there was nothing. It just says it was void and formless. And as far as uh, if nothing can become from nothing, which it has not been shown to do so, only speculated in physics, not been shown, you might as well ask why is there a universe in the first place? rather than no universe. Another silly question. It's nothing to do with God being right, the Bible being right or not. Question seven. If everyone who ever lived prior to Jesus could get into heaven by simply believing God, like Abraham did, doesn't that make Jesus a little superfluous? No. Jesus did not come to save those who are already saved. He came to save you, the sinner. Question 8. The Bible tells us that God isn't willing that anybody should perish, but His Holy Word has been corrupted through the ages by mankind. So doesn't that mean God either allowed it to be corrupted, or He was unable to keep it from being corrupted? The Word of God is not corrupted but men corrupt the Word of God. There's a difference there. Men pervert the Word of God, but the Word of God is perfect and is preserved. This is also a misleading and deceptive question. Ah, question 9. In the book of James, God instructs Christians on what they should do when they get sick. They're supposed to pray and lay hands on the sick person, and God promises to heal them. So why do you ignore God's command and run to science every time you get sick? Who says I ignore God's command in this? There are people who do lay on hands. And Christ also said, when you are sick, you seek a physician. And when your soul is ill, will the physician help? There has been a study by a doctor on this very subject of laying on of hands in prayer for the sick. He did a study of the patients in his hospital and those who had people come in and lay hands and pray compared to those who had no, no such people come in and do that with them. And the results of that study indicate that those who had prayer and laying on of hands by people healed faster and had higher recovery rates than those who did not. Evidence that Christ was telling the truth in the book of James. Question 10. The Bible tells us that Jesus threw a huge temper tantrum in the Jewish temple. He actually made a whip and whipped these people and drove them out of the temple, but not before overturning their tables and spilling their money everywhere. The Bible also tells us that Jesus called a Canaanite woman a dog. And Jesus insulted the Pharisees by calling them derogatory names at every turn. Jesus also lied to his own disciples. They asked him if he was going to the feast. He said, no, my time's not yet come. And he turns around and goes to the feast. Jesus also condones slavery. And he did not denounce the crimes of rape or pedophilia. Not only that, Jesus taught that if you call somebody a fool, you were in danger of going to hell. Then he turns around and calls several people fools. Not only that, the Bible tells us that Jesus explicitly upheld the ghastly Mosaic law 
that required children to be killed if they became unruly. Is this the person we should be emulating? No face on this one. I'll stick to Christ. Have a good day, everybody. Peace, love, and understanding be with you.